go. Hello and welcome to episode number eight of the Peace for the World series. And today I have a special guest, Michael Neal. And Michael Neal has spent over 25 years as a coach and advisor for CEOs, celebrities, and everyone who wants to improve their lives and, yeah, just um, want to enjoy life more. And Michael, I met um, because of the Creating the Impossible pro uh, program. And he inspired me also to do this video series. And yeah, hello and welcome, Michael. Hello and welcome. That's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And today's topic, we uh, both agree that we will talk about politics, but in a different way. So, um, Michael, uh, you are a coach and I have something for you, a challenge. So, imagine you are going to a room and in the room there are three people. It's Barack Obama, Vladimir Putin and Angela Merkel. And you realize that they are really stressed and there's a lot of tension between them. And they have to get to a solution. They have to decide something. What would you tell them or what would you say to Barack Obama if he sees that there's a lot of tension between both of the or three of the parties? No, it's interesting because let, let me let me check your context because in reality, if I was there, it would depend entirely on the role that I was there in. Mm -hmm. If I was being asked to mediate uh, the meeting, then... I would set some ground rules before we began about why we were there, what we were looking to do, and I would get agreement, get permission to take a, take a pause when, when, when it started going off what we had agreed the purpose of our coming together was. Mm -hmm. So that would just be a, I would do the same thing with any three people in any kind of a meeting. If I was there as an advisor to any particular one of the leaders, then that conversation would be about their state of mind and how they were showing up. Were they still present from that place that we all have inside us where we're just that little bit wiser than when we're caught up? And to what extent is it that bloody, rah, rah, <laughs> you, 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 you know, at which point it's not a problem because that happens, but we know that's not the place that we make great world changing decisions <laughs> and and so there would be that kind of a conversation going on at no point and i think this is important for our conversation unless i was specifically there in the role of political advisor mm -hmm. would i offer an opinion about what should be decided or what the tax should be and i think that is really the bigger question if we're going to have a conversation about politics which is what you asked and I'm very I've never done it so I'm very happy to have it then you also have to look at where politics fits in the grand scheme of peace because politics is a is pretty far down the chain in what's going to bring peace to the planet as far as I can see it's part of it but it's 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 like three or four levels down it's not where I would ever think to start the peace process. Why do you think this is? Uh, which bit? <laughs> the, um, why wouldn't you start with politics? Or oh, because politics is something that is part of the world of separate realities. So there is a fundamental, you could call it a, a spiritual connection, you could call it a brotherhood of mankind, you could call it Uh, the human spirit, the human collective. There is something that transcends nationality, transcends politics, transcends religion. That's why any two people from any background could be dropped in Antarctica and, and if they were dependent on one another to survive, they would connect at a level, I would call it a soul level, but, but they would connect at such a deep level that it wouldn't matter anything that had come before that. That's the level that peace starts at. That recognition, sister to sister, brother to brother, not, not in a hippie way, in a human <laughs> way, right? It's just true. Now, 
once you start getting into the separate realities that we're, you know, which are dependent on the country that we're born in, the family that we're born into, the prevailing politics of the time, you know, you would be a very different person depending on which 30 year period you had been born into. So would I, right? At that level, that's where questions of politics start to become relevant. And within politics, there are going to be different things that are, are necessary at different times. I, I've, I have yet to see a political ideology that is always going to be the most relevant or best way. Now, there are people who would disagree with me, and at the level of politics, they might be right. Mm -hmm. But that's why that's, it's never going to start there. Tree. We're a tree, okay? And there are a, a, a thousand branches on the tree. So peace is in the roots of the tree. Politics is the branches trying to agree on who should get how much sap when. So the thing is, do you think it, um, does it make sense to to then go into the politics, to get in conversations with, with people and not talk about on this political, political um, aspect, but more about the transformational um, conversation, as you name it in your book, The Inside Out Revolution. Well, it absolutely can do because it's through politics that policy come into effect. And it's through policy that there is a direct impact on the physical well-being of people. So I don't think you can, it would be idealistic to say politics is not relevant to the conversation. But if you start at the level of politics, you've lost before you've started. And, and that, again, that shouldn't be contentious. You cannot find a period in history where one political solution was agreed to by everybody and they all lived happily. <laughs> you, know, you can find ones where a political solution that was backed by the military did, and you can find ones where for a period of time, everyone agreed to put their disagreements aside for the common good. But even that is an example of what I'm talking about. It's, that's an example of connecting at the level of the tree, not the branches. The branches just have to figure out how to work together well enough to get something done, <laughs> which if to the extent that they see they're part of the same tree, which is part of a larger ecosystem, you, you know, there's an old cartoon of two men rock climbing mm -hmm. and the man at the top, they're roped together and the man at the top slips. And as he's falling past the man lower down, he looks over his shoulder and goes, boy, is he in trouble? <laughs> Right. Without an awareness of the larger system, we're all in trouble. <laughs> you know, it's not to say that at different times you don't have to make whoever's in the lead has to make the choices. That's that's how anything works. Hmm. Hmm. So um, did you ever had a, a client that was involved in politics mm. and yeah could you could you sh share some stories that you um or like something that that showed up for you well i can share some of the conversations i can't really share stories but one of the a lot of people get into politics for the right reason from what i can tell they they, they get into politics because they care And because it looks like the most effective way to affect change, mm -hmm. to, to have an impact in the world. So I'm going to put to one side the politicians who are in it for pure ego and personal gain. I'm sure they're out there. I haven't personally worked with one, but I, I, I don't pretend that that's not. <laughs> okay. but, but even the ones who care that I've had some experience with, when they get stuck in the poli at the political level, it, 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 you can't go anywhere from inside there. So Einstein had that wonderful line about you can't solve a problem at the level of thinking that created it. Well, you, you can't 
solve a political tangle at the level of consciousness that the political tangle exists. You have to go up in consciousness. You have to expand so that you can see beyond your personal opinions and agendas to, to the larger picture. And that's what the great politicians do. We talk about it in terms of their behavior. Oh, he, he, you know, this politician was so good at getting consensus. This politician was so good at doing deals. This po- but that was the output. The reason that they saw the, the value in it was that they understood that you, you, at the level where this disagreement is, you're never going to resolve that. That's always going to be opinion. <laughs> and that's why political debate will go on forever. That's why, you know, you have the houses of parliament, you know, you know, in, in Britain. That's why you have, you know, what's going on in the United States. with it, it, it has ever been thus. So it's not that I think the system's necessarily broken. I mean, that's the system. It's, it's the level of consciousness in which you're interacting with the system. So a, a, a true leader has to be able to not only have a vision that's larger than their personal preference, not only has to be able to operate at least most of the time from a level of consciousness that's closer to the tree than the branches and closer to the ecosystem than the tree, um, but, but they have to want to. It, it isn't easy. I mean, like I, you know, if you think of the politics in a company, or the politics in, in, in your field, depending on what your field is, oh, that's nothing compared to the real game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I talked to a CEO of, 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 of a huge corporation, a, a multi-billion dollar corporation, who got involved in politics and, and said that, you know, 25 plus years of running this massive international corporation did not prepare him in any way for six months in politics. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. I never thought about it like this, that when you talk on the political level that you already have the the separate reality, always this... Mm. Like, kind of a like something that is holding you back even before you even started. To I, I had a I had a really interesting conversation with my wife and my son. So my son at the time I guess he was nineteen and he's doing international studies at university and is very interested in in politics and change. And my wife is British, um, and uh, I was raised in the United States uh, with European parents. So you know we're all over the shop. And we were talking about, well, how do you create world peace? How do you create change in the world? And my wife said, I know it sounds naive, but if we all just loved each other a little bit, (laughs) right? Which, great. My son said, education. You you, you People have to be educated. You cannot make informed decisions with limited access to information, with limited access to to the facts with, with limited training and how to think for yourself, you know, that that was necessary. I, sa- I said kind of what I'm saying to you, that it's a shift in consciousness that's needed. Well, when we reflected, we realized that all three of us were saying the same thing. If we all just loved each other a little bit more, that is the result of a shift in consciousness that allows us to see each other as human beings and not as Americans, Germans, Russians, etc. Not only as, I'm not trying to take that away. That's true too. But it's not the only truth. It's not the highest truth. It's not the deepest truth. If we educated people, well, what happens when people get educated is they begin to see a wider world. When they see a wider world, their consciousness of that world expands. If I'm pushing a button because I think it's really fun to push a button and I don't know that each time I'm pushing that button, a missile is being launched, as soon as I know that, nobody has to tell me to stop pushing the button, <laughs> right? I, I start to understand that actions have consequences. Right? <laughs> well, if we go direct for a shift in consciousness, 
if we go direct to help people have a deeper understanding of our shared humanity and of the, of, of the collective spirit behind that, well, that gets us to that same place. So they're all different ways to get to that shift in consciousness, which, again, there's no way of talking about it that doesn't at some point sound hokey. <laughs> but if we can't find the peace in ourselves, all that's going to happen in our conversations when you start getting, if you're not starting with that, then as you get further and further and further away from it, whatever imbalance was there at the start gets more and more pronounced. It's like taking a bicycle that's slightly out of alignment and putting a jet engine on it, right? You're okay to be a little bit out of alignment when you're only going five miles an hour, but you start going a thousand miles an hour with an out of alignment bicycle and it's not going to end well. So you've got to get the bike right. You've got to get the alignment before you get in, before you even leave the garage. Then, as things speed up and you get further and further down the trail, you're, you're not going to lose your bearings so easily. You're not going to, you know, aim one way and wind up somewhere else. You're, you're much, it's going to be much easier to hold the path, wherever that path goes. Yeah. So you, you talked about to love each other more in a non-fluffy way. It might be a little fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did this show up in your life that you showed more love for other people? Well, it showed up for me in unexpected tolerance. Um, you know, I think the first place I noticed that something had shifted in me was in a, in, in a movie theater. Like, it used to piss me off more than almost anything on the planet when I'd be sitting in a movie theater, the movie would be about to start, and just as it's about to start, some people would walk in, sit next to me, in front of me, or right behind me, and start chatting and eating their popcorn and settling in. And, 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 and I, I hated them, <laughs> right? One of the first things I noticed, I didn't try to love the people in the movie theater. I don't know how you do that, to be fair. I just started to notice as I saw more, I, I, I didn't feel the same way. I might, if, if it carried on, I might turn to them and say, hey, could you please not talk during the movie? But there was nothing on it. Funnily enough, if I ever used to say that, which was rare because I don't love confrontation, eh, eh, you know, it would be all like guy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But funnily enough, if I ever do ask, it happened recently for the first time in probably a couple of years, people were like, oh, sure. You know, there's nothing, because they can feel it's not personal. See, that's, that's so much of this is it's very difficult to be in politics and not to make it personal, to not to take a different ideology as a personal attack and not to make a different ideology a personal attack. But when you see that it's not about you in that way, <laughs> you also see, oh, okay, you know, there's, yeah, there is a way to have this conversation and people pick up on it. It's not the words, it's not the stance. People feel what's behind it and respond extraordinarily well to a genuine desire for a better world and not terribly well to a desire for personal gain or, or external punishment masked as a desire for world peace. I totally forgot the original question, so I'm not sure if that answered it. It doesn't matter, Mike. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, what I, what I see is that whenever we get into a conversation with someone, we, we can feel where this person is coming from. If this person is coming from a place where this person wants to get something or um, mm -hmm. has an agenda on that we may not know, or if this um, person is coming from a place of Yeah, understanding and um, yeah, peaceful place. And I think that's yeah, that's a good uh, place to look to. It's a good place to look to. And in politics, so you asked if I was coaching Obama, or if I was coaching Putin, or if I was coaching Merkel. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it 
Be, long before we got into the room is where the where, where what happened in the room would happen. Right. In others, by the time they're in the room, the bicycle's already out. <laughs> right? It's unlikely it can happen. It's unlikely to suddenly align in the room. So the thing that we would be looking to and the concern that I know that politicians and other leaders that I've worked with more, I have more experience in fairness with other leaders. I don't have a ton of experience with politicians direct, but it's the same thing is the fear is, Hey, if I go in open-minded, if I go in open-hearted, they're going to walk all over me. They're going to exploit my weakness. They're going to, and it takes people a little while to see the strength that exists within because open hearted doesn't mean open documented, right? You, you, you know, there's nothing to say that being open hearted means you tell other people everything that you know <laughs> right up front or that you agree with them to get along. That's actually weakness. That's, that's actually fear. That's actually a whole different thing. So it's not a behavioral strategy to be open hearted and open minded. It's actually simply a place you find in yourself that allows you to connect at a deeper level, human to human, soul to soul. And from that place, new ideas can come. And that's really, again, we know the ideas that are already out there aren't the solution because if it can't be implemented, it's not the solution. It doesn't matter if it would work on paper. So in any political meeting, there has to be space for something new to come through and that can only come through or will usually only come through when you already go in open to that. When you go in not rigidly attached to position. But again, at no point does that imply you have to do anything. You don't have to say what you don't want to say. You don't have to agree to what you don't want to agree to. You don't have to share what you don't want to share. So it's an inner thing, not a behavior. Hmm. I once read a book called Radical Honesty hmm. and it was about telling the truth to everyone and what I found out was that oftentimes it was not the best idea to tell everybody the, the absolute it, truth all the time. It, 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 yeah, my experience of Radical Honesty, it's a lifestyle choice um, and it's just, it's a way of being in the world and um, uh it's not, I, I, it, I, my experience of it in limited doses is, wow, that's a different way of being in the world. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and I think um, I have nothing more on my mind, to be honest, Michael. Hmm. Well, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So what have you heard? Like in our conversation, what's occurred to you that, that's new, that's fresh, that That, um, that everything that um, is made in the, in the meeting room is, is already kind of set up when they, um, before the, the people come in. And that, um, that it starts not when the people are really, really messed up, but by, by giving them a chance to, to understand their own experience of life better and how it's easier to, or how to show up with more clarity and how to, to connect with people and not be so attached to their ego when it comes to finding a solution, because then oftentimes a solution is much more natural and also that the better thing for everyone. Mm. Yeah, that, and that's, that's I think, what I, I kind of was hearing as we talked as well, is that the, the real political change begins before politics. It comes from a place in us before our political orientation. It expresses through our politics, but it comes from somewhere deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful ending. Thank you very much, Michael, for being on the show. You're welcome. Thank you. And to everyone out there, I hope you liked it. This politics talk with Michael Neal. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. Bye-bye.